because I got a bunch of new toys uh, with my house and around my house. And uh, it's amazing how many people want to talk to you when they see you drive an electric vehicle or have solar panels on your roof. So I thought, you know what, this could be an interesting, fun, relaxing way to, you know, disseminate some information to a whole bunch of my untapped energy friends and community. And so this is meant to be quite relaxed. Uh, so happy to, you know, field questions. Uh, we have certain spots to do that, but really I'm here for a discussion. And the reason behind that is that I've heard a lot of different things. When people ask me questions about this stuff, um, they've been maybe in contact with some of these technologies at different places, different times, and they have their different thoughts on it. And I just want to give you my personal impression on what this looks like currently. So these are, I'm starting off with a few disclaimers. Like I said, these are definitely my personal observations and experiences. And I'm located in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. So a lot of this is very um, attuned to where I live and where I work. And so uh, this may not work depending on where you are in different other places or other jurisdictions. I'm going to try to avoid any political or ideological arguments with this. Um, I am fascinated by all forms of energy. I work for an energy company. Um, I'm my own energy producer right now, which is a lot of fun. So I just like exploring the entire space and all of this comes with compromises. So I'm not advocating that what I'm doing now is the only way. It's much, much more complex than that. I just wanted to keep it at an end user level. So I'll start off with mobility uh, because a lot of people are fascinated by this. So this is, uh, we'll start off with my electric vehicle. And uh, this motivation came about because all well, this year, uh, my, me and my family, we needed a new vehicle. And I tend to hold on to my vehicles for a very long time. Um, this year, I had a vehicle that was 13 years old and another vehicle that was 10 years old. And so in replacing one of the vehicles, I really wanted something that would last a long time. And the thought process came about, well, in five years, what vehicle would I want to see myself in? And I had a certain number of criteria. I'd been looking at the EV market for quite a while and there wasn't anything that really fit um, what I wanted, but uh, you know, it, the market is definitely maturing. And so I wanted a car that comfortably fit four people that could uh, and pull a small trailer. And so one of these vehicles came out this year, and so I pulled the trigger. And so uh, this car here, it's a Tesla Model Y, but I don't want to get caught up on the specific models or anything. I just want a general thought process around EVs. But this one can seat five or seven people. It can tow up to, to, to 3,000 pounds. It has a 500 kilometer range, and uh, it's not cost prohibitive. I mean, it's expensive, no question. Uh, but you can certainly make an economic argument that you will recoup some of that cost or all of that cost, uh, the cost differential between a combustion engine and electric vehicle. But all around, it's still a very feasible uh, vehicle to purchase. Of course, that comes with caveats, and we'll talk about that later. So what makes an EV fundamentally different from an internal combustion engine vehicle or an ICE vehicle? Well, really, in the end, from what I can tell, it's really about energy efficiency. Um, EVs for, you know, no matter what are much, much more efficient. <laughs> so if you have one unit of energy, an electric vehicle can use 77 to 100% of that energy, especially if you have regenerative braking, uh, which basically means when you brake, the energy from that braking action goes back into the system. Whereas regardless of the vehicle, uh, an internal combustion engine will at best be 30% efficient. So that means for any liter of gas, 70% of that or 0.7 liters is completely lost to heat. So as a result, EVs are very, you know, it's like they're just much more efficient. And then a lot of the both good things and bad things that come out of that are because of that fact. So I just have a couple of facts here. So typically, you know, uh, an internal combustion engine will take, you know, five to 15 liters per hundred kilometers. The EV equivalent is 1.9 liters per hundred kilometers. So you can see a radical difference there. And then just on a cost uh, metric, uh, at $1.50 a liter, it costs about 10 to 12 cents a kilometer for a nice uh, vehicle. Whereas uh, for an EV, it's one to two cents a kilometer at six cents per kilowatt hour, which is what I'm currently paying. So, the funny part about this is that because it is so efficient, an EV is so efficient. Um, for instance, in winter, uh, that causes a bit of a problem because when you drive an internal combustion engine, like I said, almost 70 to 80 to 
of the energy wasted comes out in the form of heat. And so that heat is used to heat your cabin in the vehicle. And whereas in an electric vehicle, you actually have to consciously heat the cabin and heat you know, the passengers in the vehicle. And that is why you do have a mileage reduction in winter. It's not because of the motors themselves. There's a bit of a battery effect, but, but not because of the operation of the vehicle itself, but because you actually have to keep that, that cabin comfortable. That said, uh, um, ICs also do have a mileage reduction in winter and it's about 15%. So it's not quite as drastic as an EV, but nonetheless, uh, they do have um, an effect with uh, cold temperatures. So what I found is most people really are concerned about range. And so that's that so-called range anxiety that you hear often about, you know, what happens if I try to go somewhere and I get stuck? Okay, well, so I'm just gonna try to lay out the charging landscape because it's complicated. And that's both a good thing and a bad thing, to be honest. It's a good thing because you can get electricity in many, many different ways in many different places. On the other hand, it's complicated. So you're never guaranteed to get exactly what you want at the right place or at the right time. So I'll kind of just step through what the charging landscape looks like right now. So currently, pretty much anywhere in the world, there are considered three different levels of chargers. And I just kind of broke them out by the number of kilometers per hour they will charge. So level one basically is like your 120 volt socket where you can just plug, I can plug my car into that kind of socket but I'll only get like one or two uh, kilometers per hour. So for a 500 kilometer uh, vehicle, that'll take a very long time, obviously. Um, a level two charger is something that many people have at home. I have that basically, it's like the equivalent of a 240 volt um, plug. So if you have a, um, you know, a washer, a dryer, that kind of thing, or a welder like my dad does in his garage, you can plug your car into that directly with an adapter, you're good to go. So that typically takes, you know, somewhere up to 10 hours to fill. And that's what I tend to do uh, in the evenings when I need to charge, I'll just plug it in for the evening. And next thing in the morning, it's nice and full. And for us, we only do that about once a week currently. Um, level three chargers, that's where things get very interesting. And that's the charger that is critical if you're doing road trips, if you're going long distances, because you do not want to wait 10 hours at every stop in order to charge your car. And that's where that range, range, sorry, range anxiety comes in. Uh, so you really need a level three charger that's capable of charging your car um, in under an hour. Uh, it could be 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, depending. And some of them do start at like 1500 kilometers per hour to charge. So that exists. Not only that, there's an added level of complexity because we have not standardized plugs around the world. And that's a very unfortunate thing. Uh, if you could remember a time with computers before we had USB ports, let's say, where we had this proprietary port and that proprietary port, it was very, very messy, right? And so the EV world is kind of in the same place. Uh, fortunately in Europe, for instance, they did standardize on plugs. And so they have a very similar plug. Um, and so, Every manufacturer has to adhere to that plug. But in North America and other places, Tesla has their own plug. Nissan has their own plug. Um, you know, Hyundai has their own plug. And so there's a few kind of standards, quote unquote, out there, but they are still multiple standards. So if I drive up to a Petro Canada, let's say, there's a chance that I may not be able to plug into that if I don't have the right adapters. So that was one thing I bought right away was a little kit with a whole ton of adapters so I can plug into everything. But that should not have to be a problem. And it still is for the foreseeable future until there, there are some kind of regulations that come out that mandate you thou shalt use that kind of plug. Uh, okay, so when you do charge, what does the world look like when you're driving around Canada? So this is a picture of Western Canada here. And I just wanted to give you a sense of what, uh, what chargers look like. And so overall in Canada, there are 5,255 uh, uh, level two commercial stations available. So those are like um, charge port, a charge point flow. There's a bunch of different companies out there providing these stations. And so they're relatively well populated, but they're considered, uh, like I mentioned earlier, destination chargers. That's not something you typically want to use when you're going on a road trip. However, uh, as I'll explain a little bit later, we did a road trip in BC over the summer. And this is an ideal charger if you're 
going to visit uh, you know, a park, let's say, and you're gonna be there for a couple hours, you can just plug in your car for a couple hours and get like a hundred kilometers out of it. And we did that quite a few times on Vancouver Island. Uh, so, but of course the, the real key aspect here for long distance travel is the level three charger. And so currently there are only about a thousand stations in Canada with that. The Trans Canada is relatively well covered. Like I said, Petro Canada put in a uh, coast to coast uh, charging network a few years ago. Tesla has one as well. Of course, the plugs aren't interoperable, which is a problem, but uh, you can still get by. And so in total, there's about 6,000 of these types of stations available. Uh, in contrast, there are 11,900 gas stations available. So we're roughly about half the EVs charging stations compared to gasoline stations. That said, there is a lot, a huge push. I've been watching this quite uh, closely, a huge push to just add chargers everywhere, basically. And so that is, you're going to see more and more and more of them. And even when I initially bought the vehicle, it was very difficult to charge up in North, uh, Northern Alberta. But I believe now there's a, a Tesla charger in Grand Prairie. There's one in Lloydminster that just opened up. And so it's getting there, but it's really unfortunate that there isn't just a standard charging or sorry, there isn't a charging standard so that if they put one charging station and that could service all electric vehicles. So that's a bit of an issue. I think it'll be rectified, but unfortunately right now it's still a complicated affair. Okay, so charging costs themselves. Okay, well, if I want to charge my vehicle currently, um, it, could be any, it could be any number of costs, to be honest. Um, it could be free. I mean, when I visited uh, our friends in Vancouver Island, we just plugged into their into their little RV plug and then got a free charge. Uh, so that's wonderful. Uh, when I'm at home, uh, charging in my own unit, it costs me about $5 to get that 500 kilometers. So it's uh, very, very uh, uh, cost efficient <laughs> to charge an electric vehicle because of that efficiency. And then if I'd like to do a supercharger or a level three charger, uh, Tesla calls them superchargers. And here we are in uh, Revelstoke, BC, where uh, there were many, many cars. It was the only time we really had an issue waiting to get a charger. Uh, it costs about $20 because there's that premium for delivering that much electricity at once into the vehicle. And obviously they want to make a little bit of money from that as well. So a lot of different options. So it can cost you any number of dollars depending on where you are and, and what you're doing. So very different than, than gasoline vehicles, right? Which you typically pay a standard price depending on which region or locality you're in. So yeah, exactly. For, uh, for a charging example on our BC road trip, um, which was about 2,600 kilometers, overall, I calculated the cost of about $90 for the entire trip. And that included uh, the level three chargers all the way from Calgary right through into Vancouver. But as of about Vancouver, I really didn't pay anything at all. Uh, we were close to at our hotel in Vancouver. There was a charger that was free. So I would park it there at night and get a free charge every morning, which was wonderful. And then once we hit Vancouver Island, uh, one of their um, companies called ChargePoint, uh, as long as you have an, an account on, and, and an app on your phone, you can just you know saddle up to their chargers and they don't cost a thing to use. And then on the uh, right-hand side here, you can see this is where we plugged in for our, for our friends. Um, and so, yeah, they just had a little RV port and we just plug in there at night and we would have free kilometers every morning, which is wonderful. And so I did the calculation that would have cost about $400 using gasoline at about $1.50 a liter, which actually is a relatively low price. Um, when we went through Vancouver, it was hovering between $1.70 and $1.80 at the time. So you can see just on an operational basis, the cost is much lower. Uh, but like I said, in, when it, we did do a lot of road trips, and this is one of our very first road trips where we went to Dinosaur Provincial Park. Um, it was very surprising when we'd show up at places, you know, it's shocking to people to think that you could take an EV outside of a city. The thought process is that you can't really go much more than 100 kilometers, let's say. And so we set to dispel that. So we've been to, uh, gone to Saskatchewan a couple of times. We've gone to Dinosaur Provincial Park. We went to... Um, We've been to Red Deer in Edmonton and we've also gone to BC. So you can definitely travel as long as you have to take the time out to map out the logistics to make sure that you're covered for chargers. It works quite well. Uh, so I just have a few other considerations here too. Uh, maintenance, definitely 
Maintenance is lower. There's no question. There still is maintenance required with EVs, but it's lower overall because I believe there's something like 20 moving parts versus hundreds in an um, internal combustion engine. So you'll still have to pay something, but it is a little bit lower. Uh, I do get a lot of questions about battery life. You know, um, will the battery die in five years, just like a, a, a smartphone and what do you do with it? From what I can tell so far, some of the longest lasting EVs on the road have been uh, Tesla's and Generally, what they've been seeing is that people tend to turn them in before the battery goes out and their their initial batteries are rated at around 300,000 kilometers. And I think the battery in mine is rated around 500,000 kilometers. Um, so most people don't drive that much with one vehicle. And I believe they're expecting their new batteries to be at about a million kilometers. So I'm not overly concerned about the battery life. I think we'll outlast the vehicle before the other way around. Um, in terms of minerals, obviously that makes the news quite a bit. Well, where are we gonna find the minerals like lithium, cobalt, all of that for these batteries? And that is definitely a concern, there's no question. Um, but I do you know, know a few people who are working in that industry and they're working hard to find lithium in Canada and other places. And I think it's just a part of that energy transition, right? Where we have to just try to kind of reorient our infrastructure to make that work. And just finding the right techniques to do that is, is critical. We're hoping to have a, an untapped energy talk on that in the first half of 2022. And then once again, the infrastructure. Uh, it is piecemeal, uh, unfortunately, but it is there. And if you're willing to put the effort into it like I am, it's actually quite fun. But it's not something that I would just say, hey, let's just go to... Uh, Let's just go to Regina tonight just for fun. You definitely want to make sure that you know that you can make it there and back and everything is okay. So there's a few points there, but otherwise so far so good for us. We've really enjoyed our car and it's been a real pleasure. So I just want to open it up to questions right now. If anybody had any questions specifically about the electric vehicle. So what I'll do is I'll ask um, everyone to unmute. Um... Or you'll be invited to unmute. So if you have a question, feel free to ask that. Uh, maybe as that's happening, Mark, um, mm -hmm. Brian asked, well, what if you didn't run into those free charging spots? Like, did you have a alternate game plan? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I never relied on a free charging spot. They were always just wonderful serendipity, right? Uh, but there's there's any number of super fun apps like Plug Charge uh, is one of them where, you know, if I was planning on going on a you know day trip on Vancouver Island, I would just check to see where the chargers were and to see how much they cost. And so, hey, that's there. Well, great. I'll just stop there and charge for a couple hours or an hour and just get a little boost, right? You know, you don't normally drive up to a parking lot and see a free jerry can of gasoline that you can just pour into your car, right? So that's kind of what I did. It wasn't, I wasn't using that to to dictate where we went. It was just a, you know, a nice thing if it happened. But every time we'd come home at night with our friends, I would plug in and make sure we were fully charged every night. So it kind of worked out very nicely. So maybe speaking of jerry cans, so is there is there such thing as portable uh, chargers like is there anything that you could take with you just mm -hmm. as an emergency if, if you found yourself stranded and you just needed just a bit of juice just to get to the next charging station uh, the batteries in evs are ridiculously large like they are monstrous uh and they contribute to like the, they make the car quite heavy so there isn't anything uh out there i've seen one option where there's a little pull trailer that's basically a camper that has an embedded uh, uh, battery in it that you can use as well. So that would be an option, but it's pretty expensive. Like batteries are very, very expensive. And that is the biggest cost, you know, with these vehicles currently. So they're, um, I haven't seen, I haven't heard of like mobile chargers, like let's say a tow truck service that would come by and give you that quick charge. I know that mobile chargers exist, but I don't know if there's a service like that quite yet. So yeah, you definitely want to make sure that you plan out your trip currently, because that would be very unpleasant to be stuck somewhere. And so then uh, speaking of managing surprises, um, so Yogi asked, uh, are there adapters that allow one brand to plug into the station of another brand um, so I, I know you were talking about yeah. you, you have a bunch of adapters, right? So, um, mm -hmm. is there then ever a situation where you couldn't 
uh, charge in any circumstance? Uh, no, I think there's one charging type that I don't have access to. Uh, but otherwise, I do have adapters that work with other cars brands. So it's, it's doable. It's just it's something that you have to research in advance. No question. Um, and it's unfortunate that I wish we were like Europe, where basically every car had the same kind of plug. But all the adapters exist. It's just an additional cost, unfortunately. So Mark, do you think we need an NPV comparison for both vehicles to see which one is more cost effective? <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to do that. But honestly, there's so many variables involved. Um, just anecdotally, I kind of yeah. went with a, you know, seven to eight year payback. Uh, if you use a thousand you know, dollars worth of fuel versus um, and, you know, thousand dollars of maintenance, you know, but it depends on which which uh, internal combustion engine vehicle you use, right? Because you could spend 20,000 to $100,000. So I kind of went with a benchmark of about $50,000 and mine's about 20,000 more than that. Uh, so I thought, you know, okay, I'd be looking probably about, you know, six or seven years payback. That's just, you know, kind of back of the envelope calculation. I did read though, others have argued that, um, it could be as low as three years because of the lower depreciation on my specific model. Uh, so that's possible, but it's complicated in other words. Uh, so honestly, I did not want to discuss that economic piece uh, for the simple reason that I just really like this car. I did not buy it for economic reasons. I think as an experience, it is a fantastic car. And my, like my wife said, the only problem with owning one is that we don't have two of them. Um, she, she just, I mean, it's, it's a wonderful experience. It's quiet. It's powerful. Um, it is, it's very heavy car, but it's extremely quick. And so you just feel very grounded. Like it's, it's an amazing experience all around. So I didn't do it for economic reasons, to be honest. Uh, but I do like that fact that, you know, Hey, yeah, we put up most of our money up in the CapEx part, whereas the OpEx will be a lot cheaper down the road. But I would say if you're going purely for economic reasons, I would be hard pressed to say that this is a slam dunk at this stage. They're still quite expensive all around. Thank you. And your plate number is EV, is it? <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that is covering my real license plate. So yeah, no, it's not EV. <laughs> okay. okay, thanks. I didn't realize I made it look that good. No, it's just it's just a little PowerPoint box covering up the license plate. <laughs> Maybe as we're talking about user experience, um, so preheated cabins, pre-cooled cabins, like can you ever go back from that? Yeah, honestly, that was one of my selling points for my wife uh, because she has a very short commute. Uh, she only travels about three kilometers, but she has to drive, and so. My pitch was that, hey, when you walk into the vehicle, you can precondition it, get in there. It's all nice and warm right away. You don't have to wait for the engine to run, right? Where you can do that with an ice, obviously, but that's at a tremendous waste. Whereas here, it's just, you know, like plugging in a hairdryer, in essence, obviously more cost, but it's really cheap. Like it probably costs us 10 cents to heat the cabin, right? It's really, really minimal. And so that's been very, very nice. Yes. Uh, you know, everything is always preheated, pre-cooled, all that kind of fun stuff. Yeah. So Mark, you mentioned, you know, the efficiency part, right? Yeah. So it ranges from like 80% to 100%. And, you know, I think that's why it costs more in winter, right? To heat up. So it's yep. like 40% more cost. So I was wondering, you know, the one that performed, you know, less efficient, that, that are around 80% mark. Do they still cost like 40% more because they will be wasting heat? Yeah, no, basically the only difference between 77 and 100 from what I can tell is just that regenerative braking piece. So an electric motor is extremely efficient as we all know, right? I mean, instant power, instant off. And but like, like if you use like a cordless drill, for instance, right? As soon as you hit it, it doesn't have to spool up to its RPMs. Like you get immediate power delivery. So it's really just in the in the uh, energy lost when you break that brings it down to 77%. But if you have a regenerative mm -hmm. braking system, then it's 100. Like there is no wasted energy. That's why it has to go out of its way to heat or or uh, cool a cabin, right? And mm -hmm. so 
Yeah, that's that's the major reason, to be honest, that between the differences. Mark, is it okay if I jump in here for a moment? Sure. Yeah. Um, my folks have had a couple generations of um, EVs themselves. I haven't had the fortune of uh, purchasing one myself, but regarding the heater issue, uh, some of the earlier ones used an electric heater to blow hot air and that was a big mm -hmm. power drain yep. where newer ones are more often uh, liquid cooled to the batteries and uh, they can use that waste heat for heating. So I just wanted to add that that's a big difference that if anyone's shopping for an EV, they might have watch for. Yeah, absolutely. And I believe mine has a heat pump, which is a relatively new uh, innovation for at least my my style of car. So they're getting better all the time, no question. But I mean, unfortunately, or for, you know, we live in Canada, which gets very cold and batteries don't like to be cold. Okay. And so that just is an added complication, but I wouldn't say that it's an insurmountable one by any stretch. So Mark, we've seen the landscape for electric vehicles change quite drastically, even in the last year or so. Um, whereas before, maybe owning an EV was a bit of a novelty. Uh, maybe even some might argue a bit of a, a like a status symbol. But now that you have more players in the space and the likes of maybe traditional internal combustion manufacturers like Ford and Hummer, um, or even new rivals, uh, those who haven't had any track record like Rivian, who had just a crazy, crazy IPO. Um, so what, what's your prediction, since this is a bit of a data talk anyways, what's your prediction mm -hmm. of what this looks like in even say the next two to five years? And do you think that um, for the typical consumer like us, just needing transportation, if we lean into this, can we make a difference um, in terms of carbon footprint? Yeah, I mean, evidently, that's that's a big discussion, right? Uh, I, I, I still think it's going to be difficult to kind of reconvert the entire fleet to EVs because, A, you know, there, especially with the pandemic, there are a lot of supply chain limitations that are going on. And I know, um, who was it? There was a company that uh, one of the major majors, I think it was Volkswagen, or it might have been another one that said that, yeah, we can't make them right now. Like, it's just not possible. And so I think that will actually be a limiting factor, to be honest. The other one will be just um, Canada is very wide, you know, it's very spread out. And if you live in the city, like on a day to day level, I think there's nothing better than a vehicle like this, to be honest. It, you just it's like it's like owning a phone, but with wheels, you know, as long as you charge it every night, it's going to do what you want. It's going to be there. It's going to work very well. Um, you know, so for, for a city vehicle, it's ideal. But if you kind of a person who needs to drive far, farther distances regularly, then it does become more challenging. There's no question. So I still think that it's not, you know, suited for every concept out there. But I, I would love to see when the Hummer comes out, it has a monstrous battery, by the way, it's twice the size of mine, uh, or the Ford Lightning F-150. I think those might be paradigm changers there, fundamentally, because if you can do all that stuff, that a truck would do, uh, but as an EV, I think that will really change a lot of people's minds. And Ford, for instance, they went with basically, it's exactly the same truck, same build. It doesn't look like an EV, but it is, right? And so I think it's that diversity, honestly, Tim, that'll make a big difference in terms of seeing how people want to go about this. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, I still think new EVs are still only about 5% of, uh, of the uh, currently purchased vehicles, but, it's getting better. I think the infrastructure, honestly, is going to be a bigger limiting factor in the end. Uh, we'll have to see how that plays out. So I think uh, Yogi's challenging you to, to do a forecast yep. of uh, smaller EVs. Because, um, yeah, I mean, you just listed a, uh, some of the more... Um, well-known uh, mm -hmm. ones that are coming out on the market, right? Ford F-150, even the Rivian's more based on uh, like a pickup um, platform yeah. or SUV platform. Um, so yeah, how about like the little cars? Well, I mean, honestly, from everything I've read, EVs, or sorry, not EVs, but SUVs and trucks are what sell overall, right? And so mm -hmm. Nissan has had a leaf for ages. Uh, small car, very capable, very utilitarian. It's sold fairly well. But that's not what people are buying anymore, right? I mean, it's very difficult to get a sedan or a, a hatchback anymore. And so as a result, I think just the size of, the, of EVs, the smaller ones, 
have been a limiting factor because most people don't drive that anymore. They want, you know, a crossover, an SUV, and mine is just getting into that SUV space. That's why we bought it because we wanted something like that. So that's, that's a bit of a challenge, but I think it's really a matter, that's why Rivian or Tesla's coming out with a truck, Ford's coming out with a truck, uh, you know, GM is coming out with a truck because that's what people really want to buy. They don't want, they don't want to do, you know, to make an environmental statement. They just want a cool vehicle. And so the market has to come to them in some sense. And I think that's really what will break through with EVs. Okay, awesome. Well, if there aren't any other questions um, about EVs, maybe Mark, um, shall we move on then to the next part of your talk? Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for the questions. Yeah. A lot of fun. And so this is going to be another uh, piece here. Okay, so when I bought my EV, I was chatting with a coworker, and she said, well, that's great. Okay, fine. You won't have any tailpipe emissions, but your thing is coal powered. Therefore, geez, you know, that's no better than anything else. And so that got me to on the, um, the track on production. Well, what happens if I want to make my own electricity to power my own car? And by the way, uh, most of Alberta's grid is now natural gas powered. I think there's very little coal left. I think it's only about 20%. It's scheduled to be uh, completely phased out in a couple of years. So that will no longer be an issue, uh, coal powered vehicle. Uh, so uh, after we bought the EV, it's like, okay, well, this is fun. But I started, uh, you know, thinking about... Uh, uh, solar panels. And this set me on an entirely different journey. And this one is definitely economic Shabazz, just to let you know. Uh, so the rational here, rationale completely was economic. I did not need to generate my own energy. I had some coming from NMAX and other sources. I was okay there. Uh, but uh, I wanted to see, well, does this make sense financially? And this is something that I've had a lot of discussions with people who've looked at it over the years. And I was the same way. I felt oh, from what I had heard, it would take 20 plus years to make your money back. And so that's not feasible, right, for most of us. And so, but then I did get a quote and went through all of it. And I'll kind of pass through that discussion with you. Uh, but it is actually quite a, a good economic decision. And I really just like the idea of being my own energy producer. It is a lot of fun. So a couple of the reasons why it makes sense economically are because of where we are, at least most of us uh, who live in Southern Alberta, um, geography plays a huge role into this as well as the regulatory framework. And I'd like to step you through that. First of all, uh, we are definitely on the sunny side of the street in Calgary and in Southern Alberta. I just do have a list on the right hand side that are these are the sunniest places in Canada. And all of them are either in Southern Alberta or Southern Saskatchewan. And Calgary is the sunniest major city in Canada. We get more sun than pretty much any other city out there. I think Winnipeg is in second place. Um, so first of all, if you're in Calgary, you're in a very good place for solar panels. And also there's the regulatory framework, or I say the deregulatory framework that we have for electricity in Alberta. And this is my slight diversion into a political uh, discussion here. But uh, basically we do have a deregulated uh, electricity uh, environment in Alberta. And not a lot of people think about it because they just get their bill from NMAX or Ep uh, EPCOR and they just think, okay, well, I pay it, that's it, that's all. But you can buy and sell electricity in Canada. And what's that causes? There's this whole upwelling of solar uh, uh, panels and, and uh, projects that are kind of welling up everywhere. And I just wanted to highlight one that I think has a huge impact for Alberta's economy. Uh, Amazon signed a uh, purchase power agreement for a massive 465 megawatt solar project in Balkan County. And it's uh, the biggest solar farm in Canada. I think it's going to be set up in 2023, if I remember correctly, or 2024. And that is huge. I mean, uh, and those these are popping up in a number of places in Alberta. Uh, you've seen uh, wind turbines all over the place as well. That's all because we do have this deregulated market. And I, from what I have seen and heard and read, um, it's um, AWS did choose uh, to set up a new data center in Canada, in Calgary, largely because they have access to that decarbonized electricity. And so that is a huge thing. That's going to result in $4.3 billion of direct investment by Amazon in Alberta. And I'd say that's pretty much because we have a lot of sun here. 
And for those of you who are not aware of what a data center region is, this is a really big deal. Uh, so this is a map of all the global AWS data center regions in the world. And currently, uh, sorry, all the existing ones are in blue dots. All of the upcoming ones are in orange dots. And so you can see in North America, well, first of all, in Canada, the only other one is in Montreal and there is nothing out West. Uh, in North America, there's on, there are only uh, eight of them, or sorry, seven of them currently. And there will, in Canada will be the second one. So Calgary will be the second one in Canada. And after that, we will be one of nine in all of the Americas and will be only one of 33 data center regions in the world. So this is quite an auspicious thing. I know a couple of people at, at AWS in Calgary and they're over the moon with this. They do appreciate what this will bring. And when you have a data center close to you, that does bring jobs because you want to be as close as possible to that data, right? Uh, latency is a killer for a lot of industries. And so I think this is going to be a huge, huge thing. And it's all because we have wonderful sun. Okay, so bring it back again uh, to the micro level. So the deregulatory framework for small uh, generation capability came out in 2008. So Alberta introduced the Micro Generation Regulation Amendment to the Electric Utilities Act, which allows me or you to generate electricity and sell it back into the grid, which is a really cool thing. That is a very rare thing in most jurisdictions in North America. And to me, this was the game changer. And so I just have a, light, a nice little uh, diagram what that looks like. So here are your solar panels, sun shining on them, generates electricity. I'll walk through all of these steps, but basically goes into an inverter, converts your DC, uh, electricity into alternating current or AC. Uh, you may or may not have a battery and then it goes into a meter. I'll show that to you. But the great part is that I can actually bring this electricity into the grid. So I can actually sell my electricity back into the grid. Uh, and if I'm not making enough, then the grid comes to me. So that is a really, really nice thing. If you don't have that capability, then the only sense um, around having a solar panel system, at least economically to me, or is if you have a battery, but batteries are very, very expensive. And I, at least in the US, they tend to go that route because they can't sell back into the grid. But for me, I just wanted to make money from this thing. And so this allows me that opportunity. So what does this actually look like? Uh, so just as a quick plug to my solar installer, Virtuo Energy, I stole a few of their slides, but basically, as I showed earlier, you have a whole bunch of solar panels on your roof. They come down into this inverter here, which converts DC energy to AC energy. So you can use it for all of your appliances. And then also it can pump itself back into the grid right over here, if you so desire. Uh, and like I said, you can have a, a battery as well, but to me, it, it was very expensive and I didn't see the need for it. If you were somewhere off the grid, so to speak, quote unquote, then it might be more useful, but it wasn't something that interested me. And then of course you have all these cool online monitoring tools that I'll show you a little bit about. That was, that's was that been real, a lot of fun to play with. So that's what a configuration looks like. And this is what my specific configuration looks like. So this is my house and uh, they did a wonderful uh, virtual assessment. Uh, it was very simple. All I had to do was send them a power bill and my address. And they came, they did all the modeling to show you know, how these solar panels would be set up, how much they would generate. Uh, they had these little cones of interference for all the trees that were in the way. And so my system size is actually quite large at 12.6 kilowatt hours. That's uh, because I do have an EV and they want to make sure that I was being, uh, that it could actually accommodate my EV. And so the annual, annual production is set to be about 12,000 kilowatt hours. So we'll see what that looks like. Um, but uh, so far so good based on the one month that I've had it up and running. And the expectation on an annualized basis will, will be that I will make 15% more energy than I consume. So the, hence the offset is 115%. And then these are some of the uh, items that came with it. So I actually have 37 panels now, not 36. Um, and then an optimizer and inverter. So yeah, just some quick photos of what this looks like. This is my house. These are the solar panels on the Southern side. These are my all-stars. They just crank out tons of energy. The one right here is the true all-star of the group. He is, uh, just does a wonderful job for me. Uh, these are the ones on the West side. Uh, I've only had this installed since about late October. And based on where the sun is, um, you, they're not getting as much use currently. Um, I've been very obsessed with the, you know, the path of the sun since I've had these panels. And so these guys will really produce quite well once the summer comes around, especially around March or April. 
But as you can see, it's relatively straightforward. Just these panels, they kind of anchor them into your uh, into your roof, and then they've just got little um, they've got uh, little optimizers for each panel, and then they've got just little wires that connect all of them together. Okay, sorry. Oh, I think we're hearing somebody speak in the background. Uh, and so the next stage here is the inverter itself. Uh, so that's what converts your direct current into alternating current. And this is mine right now. That's what it looks like. It's just a big box that just hums and does fun stuff. Um, and then here, uh, in blue, we'll, uh, we'll keep this for later, but this is my energy monitor and I'll show you some of the outputs of that later. We'll get a little bit into data analytics at that point too. And then the uh, crowning achievement here is my brand new bi-directional meter. So this is where I'm able to feed electricity back into the grid. And so NMAX came by and set this up and I had a really nice conversation with the NMAX installer. He said he's putting in about eight of these uh, per day. Uh, there's a huge, huge uh, uh, willingness to get these put in, a lot of uh, demand that's out there. And so I just wanted to highlight to these uh, numbers inside the red box here. I just kind of blew them up over here. So the key here is that you see this little minus sign, which means I, I have actually given 139 kilowatt hours back into the grid. And if the arrow points left, that means I'm currently feeding into the grid. If it's pointing to the right, that means I'm getting electricity from the grid. And so this, I took this picture a couple of days ago. It was not the most beautiful day out, but in the middle of the day, I was actually generating more than I was consuming. So even at this time of year, you can have some high highlights, but obviously it's going to be much, much better in the summertime. Okay, so this is my year-to-date production here. This is where we get into some of the geekiness. Uh, so these are my actual panels and I have a, an app that I can follow that will actually tell me what each panel is doing and what it's done throughout the year. And so uh, north is up, for instance, and south is, well, southwest is about this direction here. And so these are my southern panels and you can see from the lighter colors that they're doing much, much better than the ones to the east or the west. And so hoping that um, as um, we get closer to summer, that will be, you know, obviously they'll produce a lot more, but there's also an issue too currently whenever it gets snowed on, whenever they get snowed on, it takes a lot longer for these to melt off than the ones uh, at the front. And if you remember pictures of my house, it's quite high up. So I'm not going up there to clean them off anytime it snows. So I'm just gonna roll with it and see what it looks like. But currently I produce 368 uh, kilowatt hours. So. Uh, but a lot of fun. These are dynamic updates. So I just did a year to date, but you can do it like on a, you know, few minute basis or hourly basis or daily basis. So a lot of geekery and watching numbers fly past your screen. Okay, so let's get a bit into the economics here. And uh, the engineers in the group will love this. Uh, so this is the forecast production that Virtuoso offered me. And so uh, on the y-axis, we have kilowatt hour, kilowatt hours, uh, which is the unit uh, that you measure electricity in. And then the green bars are production, the gray bars are consumption. And so you can see overall, uh, like let's say go to November here. Uh, this is where we are currently. So I would, you know, at best I would produce maybe about 50% of what I need for uh, consumption um, in, uh, in this month, right? Because the sun's quite low. We only get about eight hours of electricity right now or eight hours of sunlight per day if we do get sunlight and so evidently I cannot uh, produce all the energy I need currently and same thing with December January February but when March kicks in this is when the fun begins so March April May especially June July you can see that I might be producing two or three times more than I need and so if I did not have the capability of putting that back into the grid that would just be wasted cycles like nothing would occur with that so the, the fact that I can sell all that excess back into the grid is really what makes this economically feasible. However, I would imagine some of you will say, well, what's the big deal? Because um, if you know, I'm buying and selling at the same rate, then I'll only make, you know, I can only sell 15% of my electricity. Is that really enough? Is 15% of 12,000 enough to justify the cost? Well, there's an additional wrinkle to this. Because of the, um, 
uh, deregulated market in Alberta, there have been providers that have popped up that allow you to buy and sell at different rates. So this is one of them called spot power. And for instance, I'm paying 5.79 cents per kilowatt hour with NMAX. I haven't switched to this yet uh, because I've only been up and running for about a month or so. But the intent would be once we hit, uh, let's say March right now, once I start making more than I'm consuming, I would switch to this 26 cents per kilowatt hour um, uh, rate so that every excess kilowatt hour I'm making 25 cents as opposed to six cents or eight cents in this case. So that's where you really can supercharge your, uh, your uh, production and revenue. And so that makes a big deal. So the intent with them is that, you know, in low times for about, you know, six or so months of the year, you would go with this lower eight cent per kilowatt hour rate. And then in the summertime, you would go up to this 26 uh, rate uh, cent rate. I've looked into it. I think the last time this was changed was a few years ago, but these rates are not floating. They do seem to be quite fixed and they just change them on the rare occasion. So I'm feeling quite comfortable with what I'm seeing, but if anything, they'll likely go up, they won't go down. So I'm pretty comfortable with uh, basing my economics on this. And so this is the, uh, the uh, curve. These are the curves that, um, virtuoso generated and so far so good. Uh, if I just cycle back to November, uh, I did get my November bill just a couple of days ago and these numbers look pretty solid in terms of what I, I produced and what I, or sorry, what I consumed and what I produced. So I think so far so good. I mean, we'll see how it goes, but um, they're looking pretty decent so far. So this is, uh, these are two different curves. I've kind of blanked out the actual numbers themselves. We can talk about that later if you like, but, uh, what they forecast is that about after four and a half years, I'll be break even. So after that time, I'll be making more money than I will be spending. So the red curve basically indicates if I did not have a solar installation, how much I would be spending year upon year upon year. And this ends up in the six figures. But if I have a, a solar installation, this is the revenue curve right here. And so after uh, about four or five years on break even and after about eight years or so i've paid off the entire system and it's all gravy from there so that's quite nice so basically it's this minus that to get to this point and everything is warranted for about 25 years currently so i can fully expect to be in the black for quite a number of years to come so uh okay uh let's move on to the next piece and then we can take questions about the whole solar piece okay so that's the production side well I added a little extra wrinkle because I wanted to see, well, hey, if I'm producing this energy, how am I using it? And so I bought that little box that I showed earlier called a sense monitor. There's a number of them out there, um, but this is a really fun piece of equipment because not only does it monitor your production, which is what you see here. I took this a uh, couple of days ago and uh, at that time, my, uh, my home was using 960, 16 watts. This is a real time display. And if people would like to see it, I can pop it up later on during the after hours to see what it's doing in real time. But at that time I was doing 528 watts of power and I was taking 388 from the grid. So that means 57% uh, of my solar usage was, or my, of my electrical usage was currently powered by solar. So that's kind of cool. But what it does as well is it actually monitors your consumption and it does it in a really neat data analytics way. So I'll kind of walk you through that. So what it does, basically it just clamps on to your, to your uh, electrical panel. I don't know if it's showing it in this picture here. Yeah, you can kind of see that it's rolling up in here somewhere. Um, but what it does is that it just monitors your entire consumption. And then using unsupervised learning, it starts breaking out individual appliances over time. And so this is a uh, snapshot uh, of what was being used in the middle of the day at one point. I was producing 462 watts of power using 917. Um, 462 watts is here is being produced by solar as indicated. My freezer is using 151 watts, my fridge 125. Other, which is um, items that it hasn't broken out yet was 505 watts. And then it has this vampire load, if you've heard of that term before. Um, uh, appliances that just use electricity regardless of whether they're on or off, like TVs, uh, Blu-ray players, uh, uh, video games, that kind of thing. So. It's uh, very useful in identifying the vampire usage in your home. And so these are some of the items that it's discovered so far. So it's discovered fridge, freezer, uh, dishwasher, bidet, um, my laser printer, you know, my TV, the Tesla just showed up a while ago. Uh, so this is really fun. So you can kind of see what it's using at any given time. And it's all, like I said, unsupervised learning. 
And then, so just quickly to kind of push you through this, I haven't done a lot of data analytics myself uh, because I'm kind of waiting to get more data, but I can actually export all this data and do some work on it. But so far, so good. This is doing a pretty good job so far. So this is a fridge. Most of us have fridges. Um, and so you would say on any given day, it's using about a kilowatt hour per day. And it estimates that it'll cost me about $22 a year for that. So that's cool. And it'll use about 377 kilowatts, a kilowatt hours. And so it tells me a whole bunch of different things. It costs about a dollar a month or so, a little bit more than that. Evidently, if it's going to be $22, it gives me a little graph of how much that's being used and when it turns on and off, which is kind of fun. So if you leave the fridge door open after a while, you'll know it. Um, this one's fun. This is my upright freezer. It's an Eaton Viking. I bought this in my old house and I think the freezer is about 50 years old, but this thing is a, a battleship. It will never die. And so I don't want to get rid of it. However, it is a little costlier at about $35 a year and it uses about two kilowatt hours uh, per, per day. So, and obviously it's going to cost me a little bit more. Uh, television. This one's fun to know. I didn't realize, but TVs are really, really cheap on electricity. <laughs> uh, we don't watch it a whole ton. I think it says here we usually run it about 44 minutes a day, but the overall cost is only about $3 a year. And at most it's costing, you know, about, you know, half a kilowatt hour a day or so. It's So it's really quite efficient all around. And from what I can tell, it only uses about two watts per hour uh when it's uh not being when it's not actually being in use so yeah quite efficient all around tvs same thing with uh most computers and lighting now especially with led lights and so finally the the tesla uh so this one obviously is going to use a lot more energy and on some given days uh it could be you know 30 40 50 kilowatt hours i do have a 78 kilowatt hour battery so if it was completely empty it would take almost 80 kilowatts to uh, to fill up uh, or to charge. But I just wanted to highlight this piece here. So currently it believes that it will cost me $261 for all of my mobility costs for this vehicle for one year. So that's pretty darn good. Um, my other vehicle costs about $80 to fill um, uh, for one, for about 400 kilometers. So I'm pretty happy with what I'm seeing so far. So, so far, so good. I mean, I'll obviously get better numbers as time goes on, but so far it's kind of sticking to that two to $300 range. So that's quite nice to see. And so this is just a, uh, a one month production slash consumption chart. So these are real numbers here. And so the orange, once again, in uh, in uh, on the Y axis is kilowatt hours. So the orange bars are production and the green bars are consumption. So obviously I'm using a lot more than I'm making so far, but some days it gets close depending on the time of day. And you know, if it's a sunny day out, it's not too bad. Uh, however, you can see if this is early December here when we had a lot of snow and yeah, my solar just didn't do very well at that point. So, uh, but the idea behind this is not an instantaneous production consumption. It's that annualized look, right? So overall, I should be making 15% more than I use overall. And then I can sell that difference. So some considerations around this, uh, the capital cost, obviously there's a cost to this. Um, but I would argue that it's really not much more expensive or, or if at all, any more expensive than a typical bathroom renovation or kitchen renovation. And uh, those are certainly happening all over my neighborhood. Uh, so this is not going to cost you, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and there's the opportunity to actually make money from it. So um, the capital costs can also be offset by a few uh, programs that are out there. So the federal government has come out with a Greener Homes grant. And so I'm eligible for that. I've gone through the paperwork for that. It's a little complicated, but generally speaking, it's, it's doable and you get $5,000 back from the federal government. And also the city of Calgary just, just started a program, I think it was announced a few days ago, in which you can actually pay for the installation um, through your property taxes. And so in speaking to my energy auditor, he had said that the city had gone through the US because they're far ahead of us in this uh, type of system. They uh, went throughout the US to see what were the most efficient systems uh, to get solar installed. And this repayment by property taxes is quite nice because it basically amortizes the cost to whoever owns the house at that time. So if you install it right now, you don't have to pay the full cost like I did. You can just pay, pay for it as long as you're in the house. But if you sell it, then that cost goes on to the next owner. Uh, that said, I've been told anecdotally that solar panels seem to add about 4% 
uh, value to a home, which is actually almost what I paid for the system. So I think I'm going to be okay that way if I do end up selling the house. Um, another consideration is longevity. Um, from what I can tell, they're pretty resilient uh, solar panels these days. They can withstand up to 160 kilometer an hour winds, um, hail up to, I think, like over golf ball size. So I know this is Alberta. We do tend to have a lot of uh, severe weather events, but so far it looks like it should be okay. Um, and they're warranted, like I said, for 25 years. And then of course there's the storage piece, which is adds a whole other dimension to this. Like I said, this wasn't a consideration to me. It almost doubled the cost of the installation. And to me, I was just more interested in just selling off those excess electrons into the grid. But if you want it to be completely self-sufficient and store your own energy, that would definitely be an option that's out there. And so I just wanted to highlight some references here. Very specifically, I wanted to talk about the ARC Energy podcasts. Uh, they were pretty much the catalyst behind both my uh, electric vehicle and also my solar institute uh, uh, installation. Um, I listen to this podcast all the time. And I would say if you want a really well-rounded, thoughtful um, uh, discussion on energy tra transition, you could do far, far worse than li listening to Peter Chizak and Jackie Forrest. Uh, they have a very, very level-headed view on this. And they've kind of gone down this path. And I thought, well, hey, if they're doing it, I can too. So I just wanted to highlight them. Um, otherwise, thank you so much for attending and I'm really happy to discuss this further. That's awesome. No, thank you, Mark. Um, well, why don't we um, spend some time to, to take questions? Um, and so there are a few that have uh, shown up here, but um, yeah, I, I love how you have personalized your panels, that they're like part of your team and you can tell uh, who's performing well or not. Um, we we, we actually, talk about, uh, oh yeah, go ahead, Mark. Oh, sorry. I was showing this to my team because they're, they're all geeky as well. And they actually were shaming one of my panels for not producing as well as they should. So yeah, I have to look into that. We often talk about uh, making data informed decisions. I think we hear that in uh, along the, the corporate halls of where we work, but you're actually demonstrating how you're doing this at in a personal micro level. Um, so have you perceived any behavior change either in yourself or those uh, imposed on your family? Uh, definitely from a consumption perspective, I'm much, much more aware of what we use and how we use it. Like, like clothes dryers are incredible energy hogs, uh, for instance. So that's something we, you know, we bought a couple of clothes dryer or clothes hangers in the house that we dry certain clothes with now because they are really, you know, they're basically the equivalent of, of my uh, of my electric vehicle in their usage. And so just to dry clothes, that's a lot, right? So, but yeah, I'm much more aware of what we use and how we use it. No question. The consumption piece has been fascinating. In terms of mobility, we really, the one thing is like, we still have a, a nice vehicle and, but we generally use almost exclusively the electric vehicle because it's kind of a funny discussion around that. Sorry. Um, it's an interesting discussion. It, it's very different with an EV. The more you use it, the more cost effective it is. Uh, because it's mostly the capital expense, right? So the more miles you put on it, it lowers the cost per mile. Whereas the uh, OPEX is usually, the, you know, a huge cost with with internal combustion engines. So if you drive it a lot, then you know you're going to have to service it a lot more. And so we tend to lean more towards the EV for almost anything. So on any given day, that's the discussion in the house. Well, who's driving further? You get the electric vehicle. So that's definitely, and the kids just like the electric vehicle because it's got all kinds of gadgets and games and stuff. So it's fun when you're waiting in a parking lot for your for your kids' soccer practice. You can play video games. So they like that. I got uh, hail damage last summer. So I was just wondering, are they hail damage proof or not? Solar panels? No, they're, oh, the solar panels, yeah, they can withstand. They can withstand. It's a golf ball or some, it's quite large. Yeah. Okay. And that's 100 kilometer an hour, I believe, something like that. I could look it up for you if you'd like. But yes, I did look into that I, because this is Alberta after all. Yeah. So they can save your roof from hill damage? <laughs> well, they, they do protect the underlying uh, shingles, right? I mean, 
definitely. Yeah. But yeah, they seem to be a, a lot stronger than the shingles. Okay, thanks. It looks like uh, Microsoft and Google need to know about the sunlight in Calgary. <laughs> well, Amazon got on board. I'm sure they'll be coming soon. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Yogi was curious about um, what happens if the grid is unavailable. Um, so I guess just with uh, yeah. what happened recently in, in Texas, um, it, yeah. it seemed like those with uh, rooftop installations um, couldn't consume their own generation. Yeah, so I mean, in my case, I can consume whatever I generate, but if it goes past that, I'm that's my limit, right? So I still need the grid to top up in this time of year, especially. Um, so that's why some uh, opt for a battery installation. And that's why the US generally, I think they just put batteries in because their grids in a lot of places are much more unreliable. Um, but yes, that's definitely a limitation here. Uh, that said, it's been quite rare that we've had grid outages, so I'm willing to take that risk. And then Yogi was also curious, um, so the data that is being collected, um, is that uh, like with the installer's um, uh, infrastructure? Like where, where is that data actually mm. being stored? Yeah, yeah, it is, yes. Uh, so they have full access to the installation. They can monitor it as well as I can. And so, yeah, they, so I did ask them about that, that one solar panel that seems to be slacking off and uh, I got a response as to why it was doing that. And they're looking, it's the way it's wired. It's wired into, into the, uh, the Western pad that takes longer to warm up. And so we're looking at different options to kind of readjust that if possible. Uh, but yes, I believe the data is stored with them. Or actually, no, it's, I believe it's stored with the inverter company. They're the ones who actually provide the, uh, the um, the cloud infrastructure, and then both my installer and I look at that data there. Ooh, Tesla roof. Question about that? Um, maybe yeah. uh, maybe for the uninformed, un which includes me. Like I, I know that yeah, Tesla was, was looking into that. Um, so uh, just in your journey, have you looked at that? And well, first, what is that? And have you looked into it? Yeah, I believe they offer us, they have a solar offering as well. Um, I'm not sure if it's available in Canada, to be honest. I think it's mm. solely for the US currently. So I didn't maybe look Australia. into it. I might have heard that. Maybe yeah. Australia. I, yeah, I know Australia, they have a lot of power walls uh, that they've like large scale battery installations there. And maybe they are doing rooftop solar. I don't know for sure. Um, but I didn't look into it because I don't believe it was available in Canada. I want to go with the local outfit, to be honest, too. So, I mean, that's used to our conditions, right? Mark, you mentioned um, an energy auditor. Um, what, mm -hmm. what is an energy auditor? Yes. Uh, if you'd like to apply for the federal government Greener Homes Grant, that is a requirement. So somebody needs to come into your home, assess your home for its energy efficiency, provide options on how you may be able to, you know, uh, upgrade its uh, energy efficiency. Uh, in my case, I was just doing solar. I knew that regardless. And so, but they still need to come in, take a look. And then they come in afterwards once you've done the installation. It's basically literally an energy audit as well as an audit for the federal government to know that you did the work in order to gain the rebate. But uh, I think about 80% of the cost is borne by the, by the government. But if you, uh, like whenever you buy an appliance, let's say you get that little... Um, that little sticker that says, you know, your this appliance consumes this many watts, whatever. You get the same thing for your home as well. So before and after to give you an idea of how efficient your home is. A couple of questions um, coming in. Um, could we sell the data being accumulated at some point? So just thinking about the value of that, I mean, look, look at yeah. how even just having those insights have, have had an impact on, on your behavior. What if that got aggregated a bit more? And also um, the fact that there's unsupervised learning that's happening. So yeah. what if that gets scaled up? And so what, what implications could that have? And what other applications can you see, Mark? 
Well, I mean, it's evident that Sense, the company that I bought the monitor from, that's their business model. There's mm-hmm. no question, right? I mean, that's what they do, and they're able to leverage like usage from all of these different homes to provide insights. Uh, wh- whether they're selling it or not, I don't know. I don't think they are, but maybe they are. Um, I'd have to look through you know, all the uh, the end user license agreements that I signed for that. But I think, yeah, they're definitely a point of collection for that kind of data. And that's how they're, uh, you know, partially monetizing their model, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. Uh, On my level, I'm not sure. I mean, what I could do with it (laughs) other than just kind of, you know, say, hey, this is what happens to me and do, you know, do things like this. I kind of just say that, hey, it's an interesting way to kind of approach your home and have a better understanding of how it works. So have you any thoughts? I mean, you're a data scientist, right? So Mark, now, mm-hmm. um, you know, once you've accumulated um, quite a lot of data, what what can you see yourself doing with that data? I mean, yeah, other than I, just maybe optimizing. Well, I think in large measure, it will be an optimization exercise, right? Because, mm-hmm. uh, but I'd like to get all the data streams in place. Uh, for my EV, I just bought a Raspberry Pi and there's a lot more data that comes off EVs than you ever know about. And there's an API for that. So I'm actually going to be streaming, like, you know, how fast the car is going, how, you know, at what speed it was going, you know, how many times you go over hundred kilometers an hour, how much do you break? Like it's that level of granularity. And so I'm going to be able to feed that and serve, you know, have that hosted on my own little raspberry Pi, And I'm going to do analyses on that to get a sense of, you know, what's the optimal speed to drive, let's say, or, you know, how much does winter impact efficiency? Like I'll be able to actually get those kinds of, uh, that kind of data analysis um, in place. So that'll be a lot of fun. And also it tracks who drives the vehicle. So when I get in, it knows it's me. When my wife gets in, it knows it's her. So I know she's a much better driver than I am. So I'll be able to quantify <laughs> by how much. Um, my daughter will be driving in about a year or so. So that'll be fun. Like there's a lot that I can play with on that level. Um, so I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, Mark, I was about to ask you, so, you know, we have for the combustion engines, it's, it's actually like more than 100 kilometers, around 100 kilometers, you know, the, the optimum speed yeah. for consumption. What about for electrical vehicles? Uh, from what I've heard, it's about the same. Uh, about 100 is usually the right amount, so to speak. Um, I have a heavy foot and EVs are very fun to drive. The, the, the torque is incredible. Um, <laughs> I, I have what I would consider a, a dad car of an EV, and even that can do zero to 104.8 seconds. So, wow. um, yeah, uh, and I could actually buy an acceleration boost and drop it down to about four seconds if I so desire. It's a software upgrade. It's, mm. it's, it's an amazing feeling. It's like <laughs> car as a service. Um, so... <laughs> Uh, it's really fun to drive fast, <laughs> in other words. But from what I've told, yeah, it's usually about 100-ish or so. It's a similar idea because it's, you know, a lot of it's just the friction, right? Uh, when you drive, mm. the, the frictional coefficient that comes into play. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe one more question um, yep. just about um, solar. Um, mm-hmm. And then we'll wind down the formal part of this, and maybe we can then kick kick start the the after hours, where certainly we can have more more discussions around this. Um, so, uh, uh, we, in your planning for the solar panels, um, and so this is kind of speaking to the questions about um, the geography. Um, mm-hmm. uh, how how much of that? played into the consideration. So Calgary being at 51 degrees north of the equator. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just, just maybe curious about uh, some of the, the, the more uh, technical planning details that you went through. Yeah, basically that really, you know, just generally speaking, Calgary is sunny. That's good uh, for Canada anyway, it's sunny. I, I believe the, the sunniest place uh, on earth is in uh, Yuma, Arizona, which gets almost double the amount of sun that we do. So we're not the sunniest place around, but you know we're still doing okay, enough to make money here. Um, but basically the, the biggest issue is just uh, talking to an installer and getting that model in play, because depending on what, where your trees are, how your house is oriented, it could either make or break this, right? And so I think it's really just that local 
geography that really, really matters. Like macro speaking, we get lots of sun, but if you have a lot of trees that, you know, surround, surround your house, for instance, that could make or break the whole thing, right? Or if you have a lot of Southern exposure, you could probably do very, very well. And so I've got some Eastern, some Western and some Southern, but if I had a huge Southern exposure, that would be even better.